they just I only have one MSLC hour mm -hmm. and I put that on Tuesday. I so I also just grade the homework on Tuesday. So just they should really have ninety percent of the time. Oh, that's screened all the way. Oh wait, so so this I'll is not recording right now, but it's it's seventy seven. Don't worry about it. I thought whatever you need to do four times. Uh, okay. Yeah, everything's like this. I have a bunch of stuff on it. Ale kam jsi schopný dojít? Máme dojít až k tobě, nebo jsi schopný se někam přiblížit? Ať už tam bude záspaj, kdo bude si pátek, že jo? No, I usually just work it out myself. Jezdím po tý hotelu, že jdou, já nevím, on zavěděl, že to může být ze spalní. Když jsi bys došel do hotelu, tak je to ideální. A když ne, tak tě můžu. Tak tě můžeš 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 tak v deset hotelů ani a vyrazíme v deset, jo? No, to je tady. No, like just some extra notes. Extra notes, yeah. Oh. And I should have worked out of this. Probably like that. Yeah. Let's just do that to see if I can do slash my last name. I also imagine if I just Google your name, it's just going to show up. That's yeah. usually how I find people's OC websites. Yeah, I just started uh, uploading my recommendation notes. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. for it once, and then I realized oh, no. as well. <laughs> to work for scanning and work for But um, they're kind of written, so I'm sure. Are these reference notes typed? Yep. Yeah. They might like that a bit back. The ceiling. <laughs> <sighs> So does 2163 have online course? Mm -hmm. uh, so that course has to be really easy because if your mother is great, it could be a PA course. The presentations are different. Wait, that too? Like, uh, yes, the plan for you in that, like, in that, there comes back to the new money for the presentation of happiness. You know, I get solutions for happiness. And then also, yeah, I found that I'm going to go with this one. This is my job. No, should I recall the seat? No, should I recall the seat? No tak jako jistě, no. oni ho ani nemají tady, on říkal, že to si můžou být vlze, no. že by ho jaký tam možná mají, ale on říkal, že jsi spokojený. Jako bej, zvejte, že jsi spokojený se sedmičkou taky doporučoval, on říkal jako osmičku, ne, že to je blbá, pak říkal desítku. No. Já ještě vlastně nevím, co on to vlastně doporučoval. Ale oni tam ale nemají, tam mají 10 R, že jo, já nemám říkal, že to moc velký, ale nevím, jak je to třeba velký porovnání s tím. V tom případě, to je moje větší, že oni jsou to velký. Když jsem byl PA, když jsem byl PA, když jsem byl PA, když jsem byl PA, let me just go and slowly start our colloquium talk. Our speaker today is Lubov Spitz from the Charles University. Spitz University, which is perhaps a little bit too old. And the topic of this talk is going to be mainly about collection of results he obtained in the last 20 years, in the 20 years in the area which is involving function, spaces, and optimal embodiment, mainly the application on 
So for that, in bed, in Thank you very much. Thanks for this nice introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very uh, pleased uh, by this opportunity. I'd like to thank the Ohio State University for this opportunity to give a colloquium talk here. Um, thank you for spending your precious time with me. So this is, uh, I'm, I'd like to introduce a method that I developed together with my friends uh, the last two decades or so. And uh, <clears throat> in sort of layman terms, because uh, I, I'm aware that it's a colloquium talk, so I've not uh, planned to go to any details, but of course I'm very happy to provide them if anybody is interested. So it's about finding a, an optimal partner in the city of function spaces. And I would like to stress that this is a mathematical uh, talk. Uh, so uh, uh, finding an optimal partner in real life is maybe possible, but my methods uh, do not work for that. Uh, on other skills will be required. OK, so <clears throat> let's start with some very, very general uh, observations. So in mathematics, very often the <clears throat> task we are supposed to solve has the following form. Somebody gives you two sets, x and y, and a mapping. And the question is uh, whether the mapping is bound, is defined on this set x and whether it takes values in the prescribed set y. Um, the theory is, so, so, so far these are just sets and the mapping. But the theory is usually more, more fun, and it's also more useful if those uh, x and y's are some algebraic structures uh, endowed with some topological properties. Right? And uh, typically, x and y are linear spaces equipped with a norm. Like I say, not necessarily, but, but typically, uh, often. And t is usually a linear operator. Again, not necessarily it can be sublinear or anything, but, but in most cases, uh, in applications, this is the situation. Uh, and I suppose, uh, wh what I mean by improving, improving a result. So suppose that a task is difficult, yes, it's possible. In that case, you know, top scientists are working in the field and they are publishing results one after one. So, so once upon a time, an author, A1, proves a theorem one, which tells you that T takes X into Y1. Then some years later, uh, an author, A2, proves theorem two, which tells you that T actually takes X into Y2. That is one thing he proves, but there's another thing he proves that his result is better than the preceding, right? That, uh, that this is better. And then later still, and you know, let me <laughs> provide by induction. I mean, all of you know this from your own <clears throat> research, right? Uh, and also AK proves theorem K, which says that this is, um, this goes into YK. And it's far better than everything known so far, in particular, all that rubbish in the previous K minus one theorems. So what do we mean by better? This is important here. Well, better in this case, uh, you know, if we go back to here, if you want to say that if you want to say that this result is better than that one, that means you need to, to show that this result implies that one, which in this case would mean that your set Y2 is actually smaller than the set Y1, because then it just implies by inclusion, right? But um, in, um, in our theory, um, the uh, inclusion is not enough. We would uh, want in, in order to say that the second re result sorry, is better than the first one, you would need that these two things, uh, these two objects are in relation which we call uh, uh, continuous embedding. So this symbol, this hooked arrow, this umbrella-like uh, shape, stands for what we call a continuous embedding, which means, okay, there is an inclusion, but inclusion is not enough. Uh, also, um, Together with the inclusion comes the continuity of the identity operator. So the identity, identity operator is continuous from Y1 to Y2. Then you can say that the result is better. Okay, so um, I got this inspiration uh, from these guys here. They say it's getting better all the time. And then there are some complaints about the teachers and school, and I mean, who would blame them? Um, so, so they claim that it's getting better all the time, which is, a, which is an important philosophical concept. And I will return to it. By the way, on this picture, you've seen this picture before, right? 
Um, but on this picture, do you know that there is a professor of mathematics on this page? How many of you know where he is? Okay, so I'll show this guy here, the professor of mathematics. His name is Dotschlon, better known as Louis Carroll. Back to our problem. Uh, so they say it's getting better all the time. Okay, so is it really getting better all the time? That is the most important philosophical problem that I'm trying to solve. Or can it be stopped somewhere? Maybe there is a threshold under which there is no more getting better, right? And that is the point. So my uh, attitude towards this problem could be uh, compared to the philosophy of the soccer goalie. Um, you know, um, if you, I, I know in America, soccer is not so popular, but in Europe, you know, young boys and also girls, they play soccer and every one of them wants to score goals. But there is a one guy on each side who does not want to score goals. He's a goalie. He's standing in that, in that goal and he prevents them from scoring. And that is exactly what we want to do here. This is something like in an orchestra, the bass player, you know, he stands somewhere in the shade, nobody sees him, but he's the most important guy in the orchestra, right? The bass player. He's the director of everything. And this is exactly what the goalie does in the soccer. So how does it work in mathematics? So general aim is to find an optimal object with the required properties, which means, you know, okay, so here are the guys who score goals. First guy scores goal, another one, another one, another one, another one. And now here comes we, and we say no more scoring. Right? We want to find an object which cannot be improved. So that is the general philosophy of what I'm, what I'm doing in, in my mathematics. Trying to... But implicitly, you know, it's you that the object, why are of course. linearly ordered? No, no, not linearly. But there is some, some ordering that there has to be. Not linearly, that's too much to say, but... Uh, but some sort of ordering, of course, is, is necessary. Uh, some sort of, uh, I mean, this, this, this is a pool of competing objects. So there has to be some, some way how to compare them. So you are right about ordering, but not linear. Okay, so, so what, else, what do we do? So what is find, how to find the best possible object. So if you want to find the best possible mathematical object in, in some pool, you have to know two things. First of all, what are the required properties? What do you want from your object to satisfy? And second, what is the pool of competing objects? I mean, who is the contestant in that competition? I mean, who am, am I going to compare with? Another inspiration of the same guys. They say, you know, uh, this is interesting. They say, I've got no time for trivialities. But uh, we have, uh, we've been, I mean, I was uh, given 50 minutes, so I have, I have plenty of times for, plenty of time for triviality so let me show you let me explain the philosophy on a very trivial example uh, if i uh, this is really trivial really really very trivial i give you a real number from uh, open interval zero one can you find a bigger one yes you can if i give you x from this interval can you find a bigger one no not necessarily sometimes you can sometimes you cannot is there an optimal in this case, optimal means largest, such x. Well, no in the first case, yes in the second case. Sorry about this triviality, but it contains the idea. It contains the principle. Okay, so what do we do in analysis? What operators? Well, okay, so in analysis we work, you know, I mean, we, we are proving theorems that uh, contain uh, change and, uh, and speed and things like that. So we want to describe some, usually some physical or economical or sociological, or whatever phenomenon. So we often have to employ differential operators. So then we get this um, nice theory and the mathematical model of the phenomenon and we get the differential equation. All of you have seen differential equation at least once. Yeah? Um, if you want to solve the uh, differential equation, we don't use differential operators because uh, usually they are too difficult to deal with. And we instead do the uh, sort of converse operation, we use integral operators, right? And if you want just to prove that a solution exists without necessarily finding them, it, and we leave the finding of the solution to the numerical guys, you know, like we 
we are great theorists, you know, we don't care, then we need embeddings. <laughs> what is an embedding? An embedding is a <clears throat> continuity operator. Uh, sorry, a continuity of identity operator. So uh, embedding is an identity operator from one set to another, which means the object is the same, but it, it suddenly falls in a, in a box with completely different uh, distances, for example, right? Okay, so what next? Uh, what do we want from these operators? Well, okay, there are at least uh, three important properties of operators that I'd like to mention that I uh, consider the most important of them all. It's a bound, it's a continuity, a boundedness, and compactness. I will explain later what I mean by those because on a colloquium talk one has to be uh, more, uh, to say, uh, elementary, right? So, uh, what about the sets X and Y? Okay, so X and Y can be basically anything, but in my uh, vision of the world, the most fun and also the most useful results you obtain if you consider them to be function spaces. Now, what is a function space is a philosophical question. There is no definition of what a function space is. It might be a box that contains uh, something else than functions. It doesn't have to contain functions. It doesn't have to be a space and still it can be a function space. But we will see plenty of them, so, so we will describe this on examples. So here, here is a nice quotation that I'd like you to read. Uh, it comes from an editor's comment to one of my friend's paper. It says, I don't see interest in this paper. Why waste time on the study of function spaces where everybody knows L2 is all one needs. I leave this to you to make an opinion on it. This is interesting. You know, this is not a re referee. This was an editor, so I know his name, but I'm not going to tell you. Uh, so let's... It's time for an example. So suppose that you are given a function, scalar function of several variables, that, that's a nice function in order to describe a lot of interesting phenomena, and we use its gradient. I mean, I mentioned differential operators. This is the most uh, uh, elementary differential operator, gradient. And assume that you know from some a priori measurement that your uh, uh, gradient is actually integral in some power, yes? Can you then say that also the function itself in some power is integral? Can you say that? And if you can, what is this power? What is the relationship? In a mathematical language, given P and Q, uh, given P, find Q such that if the gradient is in this box here, LP, uh, U is in the other box LQ. Now, what are these boxes? These are the first two function spaces we are meeting today. Those are Lebesgue spaces, right? Uh, LP and LQ are Lebesgue spaces. Uh, I'm not going to go to definitions, but in this case, I'll make exception and just uh, recall that for any P uh, between zero and infinity, we can say that U belongs to a Lebesgue space LP if this integral, sorry, is, uh, is finite. <clears throat> then uh, once you have that, you can define the functional. You just take a piece root of, of this nonsense and, and uh, <clears throat> you can prove that it is a norm. So important thing is that this functional here is defined for any measurable function u and the belongness to the space is the same. Sorry, there I'm missing. It's my teching, but there should be also the other other um, implications is the same as the not, uh, this uh, functional or a norm if you want being finite. It's not always a norm because I allow little p's less than one, but it's always a reasonable functional. It's always actually quasi norm. Now, what about this? This is also a philosophical question. So, so this guy says that L2 has all the answers. It was it has all keys to everything. Okay, I don't agree, but you know it's a free country, so whatever you can think. Uh, he can he can think what he wants, but are the back spaces enough? Well, in my opinion, no. Uh, we can go to an example from history to look at this. There was this famous Paris crisis in mathematics four days before Christmas in 1807, when this guy, one of the greatest heroes of all times, Joseph Fourier, 39-year-old, 
submitted his uh, work, Theory of Heat Distribution in Solids, to Paris Academy. What he did, he just studied the distribution of, of heat in a thin plate, and um, uh, he uh, proposed this bold theorem. There's some, some sort of a formula and says, if this function f that, uh, that describes uh, uh, this um, uh, that describes the the temperature on the on the edge can be expressed this way then the temperature will be the function of uh, two variable variables x and y and will be obtained this way uh, so this was a completely revolutionary revolutionary act and uh, there was a committee uh, established to to consider his, his work so it was interesting who was there it was Laplace Lagrange uh, Lacroix Munch and Poisson and um, uh, okay so uh, Lagrange was the oldest and uh, so he had a main uh, word there and he was a big um, enemy of Fourier and he so he sort of influenced the committee and the decision was uh, made very fast they said the work of Monsieur Fourier does not bring anything new or interesting and manuscript got rejected. Uh, Simon Poisson, who was the youngest on the committee, you know, like he was 26, uh, was, uh, <clears throat> because he was youngest, had to write down the report and this, in the spring of 1808, the <clears throat> work was uh, basically dead for a while, of course. But uh, ever since then, ever since 1807, Everyone tries to prove convergence of Fourier series in, one, in some way, because the main point of disputation was whether it will converge. This was the first time when a function was uh, written in the form of an um, infinite series of trigonometric functions. Of course, Taylor series were, were known before, but, but not this. So this was a very bold thing. And even in you know, like 1821, there was this famous uh, Cauchy, um, book in which Cauchy <clears throat> writes that um, that uh, infinite sum of uh, continuous functions is continuous which is a nice theorem but completely false but it but it shows that you know in early 19th century nobody knew what was you know what is the uniform convergence and so on and so on so Fourier had to defend himself by uh, of course he also didn't have all the all the proof at that time and and uh, he he also tried to prove that the thing will converge so how do you prove that fourier series converges uh, a perfect tool for that is the hardly do maximal operator so that was not available at 1807 but if you wait um 120 years or so you get these two great uh, guys in in the united kingdom who <clears throat> developed a powerful theory and using the hardly do maximal operator you can show convergence of Fourier series and eventually you come up to the decision that Fourier was right. But what do you need to know is the boundedness of hard little wood maximal operator on certain function spaces. So how does that work? Well, okay, so let's uh, denote it by M <clears throat> and then the following is true. If you give me a, if you give me a P strictly bigger than one, then the following implication is true. If function is L in LP, in Lebesgue space LP, then the maximal uh, function, <clears throat> I mean the, the image under the hard little wood maximal operator of that is in the same space. This is not true for P equal one. Simply no. I, in simple, simple uh, examples show that this is not so. So what do you do there? Suppose that you want to do something with your L1 function. And what do you put here? Can you put there a Lebesgue space? No, you what can't. Is M? What is M? M is the hardly the wood maximal operator. It's, it's, it's here. So uh, what is M? What is the formula? Oh, what is the formula? Okay. <laughs> Supremum is taken over all cubes in Rn such that they contain the point. And, uh, Supreme of this. <clears throat> uh, 
another possibility what if what if you want you know what if you want a converse task what if you want your image to be in L1 what what you put here can you put a backspace well basically you can but if you do that then you lose you, you know you're losing information terribly so both tasks are solvable, but not within the spaces. You have to use uh, more uh, general function spaces. So typical answers, you can take the weak L1 here, <clears throat> and you can take, or a, a, a Lorentz space if you want, and you can take L log L uh, here, <clears throat> which is an orlich space. So here, you see two more scales are necessary in order to do something, to do something uh, reasonable with, with this. You want the convergence of uh, Fourier series close to L1. You need to work with these guys. Right? Okay, so another example. What about Laplace transform? That's a very you know, well known, important thing. Okay, everybody knows this. Laplace transform is a, is a bounded operator on L2. So if P is 2, then F is in L2, then, uh, then the image is also in L2. If P is less than two, then uh, there is this uh, relationship, which is a little bit more complicated, but it's not terribly difficult to prove. But an interesting uh, question is, what, what happens if P is bigger than two? What can you put on the other side? Can you put a Lebesgue space here? No, no, there is no Lebesgue space in this world that you could put here, none of them. You have to do something else. You can either you know, give it up and say, okay, this is insolvable, or you can settle for working with some more general spaces, like Lorentz spaces, and get a nice answer, right? So Lorentz space, no problem. Lebesgue space, impossible. So, my opinion is that this guy with L2, uh, you know, uh, is, is wrong, but like I said, it's up to everybody. So back to our example, so our, Situation was this, uh, we had uh, this gradient in, in LP and we are interested in what does the function itself. <clears throat> or maybe, you know, now we know that we are interested also in more general spaces. Why don't we write it uh, this way, sorry, that should have been an X. <clears throat> if the gradient is an X, uh, I want to find a Y such that uh, U is in Y. This can be written in the form of a Sobolev embedding. This W1x um, is a the classical notation for a Sobolev space, which is a space named by the great Soviet mathematician Sergei Lovich Sobolev, who studied these things in, in uh, connection with uh, finite energy of systems in 1930s and obtained remarkable results and uh, very formidable theory uh, was established. So, so, so the question I have here can be written in the form of a Sobolev embedding. Is this true, uh, or given an X, can you find a Y such, such that this is true? Okay, so we can define a Sobolev space by a very simple, simple way as a collection of all functions such that the function is in X and also the gradient is in X. This one here means that the gradient is of the first order. There are also other order spaces available. Um, so back to the question. Given X, for which Y, one has the Sobolev embedding. And the uh, question is where to look for the answers. Where to look for the answers. So you give me an X. Let's, let's uh, see it once more. You give me an X and you ask me to find the Y. Such that this is true. And you would like to get some good Y, yes? Not, not, not to lose too much information. Because losing information here is not recommended. So where to look for answers? Uh, my answer is visit the city of function spaces. That was actually in the title of my talk. So what is it? So city, I have this vision, you know, city of function spaces is, uh, is a collection of, uh, I, I just see it as a city. Of course, it would be difficult because it would be infinitely dimensional. So it would be difficult to depict it, but it will have, uh, houses and squares and streets and districts and all this nonsense and um, what exactly is a function space so uh, each house in the city represents a function space in my vision how does it work well uh, okay so let's have an example so here is a house in the city of function spaces this i mean you've seen lp but you probably haven't seen l41 so 
So this is this is the house which which uh, corresponds to the Lebeck space L41. It is of course on the Lebeck street, which is rather long street from L1 to L infinity. There are infinitely many houses, but uh, but they are sort of nicely nested. So the street is uh, relatively um, straight. And uh, so here is a here is a tag. It, it tells you uh, this is the label. Here it tells you what the uh, what is tested with your, I mean, you bring a function to this house and you want to enter. And if you cannot enter unless your function has certain property. Each house uh, has uh, different, uh, different uh, testing on its, uh, on its door. And of course there is a guarding dog, you know, a very, very dangerous one who, who will just integrate your function and see if you can get in or not. So this is the, how the city of function spaces work. Um, I mean, how not to get lost in this? Well, of course, there will be houses, streets, and districts, as I already mentioned. And at each district, um, a different properties will be tested. I already mentioned that. So what, what uh, possible features will be tested? So there's a size of a function, continuity, smoothness, positioning, oscillation, variation, whatever you want, you know, all kinds of all kinds of uh, function spaces. Of course, uh, if you cross borders between the districts, uh, you might be, you know, uh, sort of warned that uh, by some there are nice signposts and everything, so so you know what to what you will need in in the next district. And um, uh, navigation is not particularly easy because there are confusing crossroads, right? Because some some of the houses. Uh, they belong to not only one street, but to more streets. So it's like crossroads. Like for example, this this space LPP Alpha is you know this is the famous um, Zygmunt class, but it's also a Lorenz Zygmunt space because it has these three three um, parameters, and it's also it just happens to be also an Orlich street. So the driver here is confused, and he's in some conversation with somebody. Uh, is it on the Orlich Street? No, it's on Lawrence Digmund Street. What? Where should I go? And of course, uh, there is this L2, uh, which is my tribute to that editor I mentioned before. That is the center of everything. That is the, say, cathedral on the main square. So, uh, he, you know, here he, you he have a main square and a cathedral. This is L2. There should have been a tag L2. I must put it there. And uh, it's on the many streets, so uh, there are many streets that go, you know, in, in, in all kinds of ways from here. So this is city of function spaces. Now, important principle. So how does a continuous embedding work in the city of function spaces? What is a continuous embedding? Well, an embedding is always a one-way stretch. So sorry to Peter Sellers' fans, you know, like the two-way stretch. This is the one-way stretch. It's always one-way street, almost always, unless the space is the same or almost the same, then it is always a one-way stretch. Typical Sobolev embedding is uh, so you go just one way, right? So you you start in a in a Sobolev in a Sobolev space, and you go to some other space. In this case, you go to the Lebeck space. Yeah? So so you start in a back door of a house on the Sobolev street, and you find a secret passage which is strictly one way that goes to um, uh, to a house on a Lebeck street which is um, in a very special relationship with this, you know, according to the parameter P and also according to the dimension of this set omega. This uh, ladder is one way, you cannot go down, not, not every function from here is, uh, is allowed to this house, but this way it works. So this is what I mean by continuous embedding in the city of function spaces. So, how do we properly handle Sobolev embeddings. How do we properly handle? So uh, our task was the one that I mentioned before. Let's try if we can to find the best possible space if this, this, that works in the Sobolev embedding. Optimal, optimal space, optimal partner. So I went for inspiration to this guy. This is Chuck Berry who has this nice uh, song Memphis, Tennessee, where he says help me operator which is exactly what I'm going to use. And on the second line, he says more than this, I cannot add. 
which I translate that the operator should not be linear, right? I cannot add, right? So, uh, so this is a clever guy, but you have to understand what he's saying. And this is exactly as this first theorem. So first achievement that I, that I obtained together with my friend Ron Kerman from um, Brock University in Southern Ontario, is that a Sobolev embedding, any Sobolev embedding in a re uh, rearrangement invariant district can be reduced to continuity of a one dimensional integral operator. In mathematical terms, it looks like this. Sobolev embedding is the same as the boundedness of a Hardy operator, Hardy type integral operator, this one that we have here. So this is a very, very important principle. Um, the, po the proof is based on the, on the famous theorem of two Hungarian mathematicians, Poya and Sege, and, um, and it has a big disadvantage it works only for the first order because Poya Sege theorem works only for the first order. But at least for the first order, we get something. So this is our first result. Yes, we can reduce a Sobolev embedding. Sobolev embedding is a terrible thing because you work with functions of several variables, and now you can shrink it to something one dimensional, right? It's like if you symmetrize, you know, your functions, you have functions here, and you symmetrize them to something which is nice, you know, radially decreasing, and it, then it becomes a one-dimensional problem, and we have this reduction principle. So this is the first uh, uh, principle result of ours. Uh, then we can ask whether we can nail down the optimal partner, and um, yes, we can, with the help of, of, the, of the reduction principle. Uh, there is this theorem, um, a little bit later, but. Uh, again, together with Ron, we proved this, that um, if you give me a, an X, a domain, domain space, then I can actually write down the formula for the range partner, for the optimal partner, so here, here is your optimal partner, in a Sobolev embedding. And here is a formula. Where this just, okay, so this formula is not particularly easy, in many cases, I can give you a lot of uh, sensible examples, but in many cases, many other cases, the results are not that satisfactory because to, to get this formula, you need to understand several operations. One of them is this star here, which is just a Steiner symmetrization operator. That is okay. But then you have this X prime here and Y prime there, which is sort of a Kurta dual. So there is some, some sort of symmetrization involved and duality. So <clears throat> this means that a thing is given, but it's given rather implicitly. But at least this is something. So this is a formula given an X, then uh, in Sobolev embedding the optimal, optimal range partner is this one, which means that I am this goalie, you know, this bass player, I told you. There were guys before who proved this and that, you know. And I'm telling them, okay, all your, all your uh, results contain mine. This one is the smallest. And moreover, this one cannot be improved. Uh, there are at least two good reasons why uh, to do this. Because first of all, you are improving the results, which can have some impact in the, in the applications. And second, you are telling you know, the next generations that there is no need to try to improve it, because it's impossible. You cannot improve it. So this is, this is uh, the motivation behind it. Uh, the disadvantage is that this works only in the, in the rearrangement variant district. It, it does not work for uh, spaces of, I don't know what, continuous functions. Uh, smooth functions, oscillation functions, campanato spaces, more spaces, for those it doesn't work, but it does work for all uh, function spaces that are in the in that city in a rearrangement variant district. So, does it work? So, sorry, what is the X prime of Y prime? Okay, that's a curved dual. Are those functions of several variables, but this is function of one variable. 
it can be actually a function of anything you want. Uh, it's uh, now it's this formula is one. Okay. Yes, but um, okay. So x is um, a set of functions on some uh, measure space. All you need is just uh, this to be um, um, sigma finite. And uh, x prime is just a set of all functions such that integral f star g star is finite for every f in x. It's called a Goethe, Goethe jewel in literature. It, it's um, from 1930s. Yes, it's, a, it's almost a topological jewel, but not quite. Yes, it's a it's a certain cert other other uh, type of duality is involved here. It's a duality with respect to the L1 pairing, which is not exactly dual, but in many cases it con it uh, coincides with dual. What was star again? What was star again in that definition? Of okay, star is a non-increasing rearrangement. <coughs> oh right, okay. You know what that is? Okay, good. It's an inverse to distribution function. Okay, let's go further. Uh, so this question, of course, can be reversed. Can we obtain uh, the optimal domain when the range is given? Yeah, of course, no problem. Uh, again, I have a formula. But this time the formula is not uh, terribly nice because it has this measure preserving uh, equivalence here. So I can give you this formula, but, but it's not, um, not explicit. So some effort has been uh, made to make this uh, formula more explicit, and it turned out that sometimes this is possible. Um, uh, it will actually come up from the next example. Question is, can we get both spaces optimal, like an optimal pair? Yeah? Like not only the partner is optimal, but also I am optimal for it. So um, again, there is an inspiration. By the way, there is no professor of mathematics on this picture. But um, these guys tell you, uh, give me three steps. Yeah, give me three steps. In fact, I need only two steps. I don't need three steps to optimize my situation. If you give me an X, what I do is the following. I first find uh, the, the optimal partner on the other side. Then I find the optimal partner for the optimal partner. Uh, let's call it X tilde. Then, of course, the okay, so the embedding is true. This is an optimal pair that can be proved, and this is bigger. Now, question is, can it really be bigger? Uh, that's an interesting question. The answer is uh, yes, it can in general, but it doesn't happen if X was known to be an optimal partner for some possibly different space. Now, this is uh, one has to think this over a little bit but I can uh, put it down into this theorem. If you are somebody's optimal partner, then you are optimal partner of your own optimal partner. Well, that's a good news, isn't it? Right? So, uh, but you have to be, you, you're coming to this as a data, you have to be somebody's optimal partner. You must have someone to whom you are optimal, then you are okay. Uh, Ellen, uh, Lebesgue space with the dimension, uh, with uh, you know where p coincides with the dimension is nobody's optimal partner. That's a sad bunch. Of, oh, can you? Uh, Lp where p is less than that, less than dimension, perfectly works. Yeah? So there is a dramatic difference between these two spaces. Okay. We proved the following uh, connection. I'm not going to details. I, I can if you, if, if you want, but uh, no, not now not uh, not uh, voluntarily so uh, <clears throat> there's a there's a characterization of what does it mean to be someone's optimal partner which we did not expect and an unexpected connection by interpolation uh, if if your space this is if and only if the space is optimal partner to someone if and only if it's an interpolation space to certain pair of Lorentz spaces again i can provide details of course uh, Ron and I, I must tell you, you know, one more motivation for studying function spaces is that you can make headlines if you study function spaces. I mean, look at this. This is Ron and I on a front page. 
uh, you know, the point is not that uh, we made a front page, but the point is that we actually uh, managed to get Blackboard full of function spaces to a front page of major Canadian journal. <laughs> Uh, also you can <laughs> and also you can observe that 25 years ago I was young but that's true let's go to the second okay we will probably have to end soon but uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about was compactness so let's make it short okay 1997 I was working in the University of Bonn and uh, once I went uh, for a toilet and on the on the corridor I met Mark Steinhauer, a very clever guy, and he asked me the following. If you replace in a Sobolev embedding, the Sobolev, uh, sorry, the Laurent, the uh, Lebeck space by the Laurent space, by this one, the weak space, will the embedding be compact? I just like to know that it's a sensible question because it's a bigger space. I say, wow, that's a question. I forgot about the toilet, went back to my, uh, to my office, and I proved that this was negative. I proved that um, the answer is no. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going back to Mark and I'm saying, okay, the answer is no. Then he says, oh, that's a pity because if it was a yes, I could prove the regularity of Navier-Stokes equation. And uh, okay, you all know that it's a million dollar problem, right? It, it wasn't in 1997. So I, if I knew it was going to be a million dollar problem, I would prove a yes uh, answer, of course. But, but I didn't know it. But I, know, but I knew it was an important problem even then. And, uh, and uh, so, so I, uh, I mean, it was not difficult to get an answer to Mark's question, but, uh, but uh, it um, inspired me for a very interesting and uh, long time research, uh, which actually led to some interesting outcome later. So uh, let me just show you how compactness works. What is a compactness? Compactness is that if you have a bounded sequence and it contains a convergent sequence. This is the most important part of the whole theory of Sobolev embeddings because uh, you get at the beginning you get a bounded sequence this is just a mess but then somebody you know this, the compactness of the embedding tells you that there is a convergent subsequence and that is a path to your solution that leads you to the solution of a differential equation. So this is the most important part of all of it. How does it work in the function of uh, functions in the city of function spaces? So, okay, so uh, in the back of the house, there is a garden full of you know, guys, so you can call it a bounded sequence and there is nothing convergent whatsoever, but um, you know, suddenly, if it's a compactly embedded into another house, suddenly there is a there is a convergent sequence that converges to the solution. <laughs> so, so so this is how the compact embedding works. And the question is so so okay so so my answer to Mark uh, question was negative. Um, the philosophical question is where is the gateway to compactness? So if you look at the map, so uh, from the Sobolev space. Uh, you, you can uh, find uh, compact passes to, to Lebeck, uh, you know, to Lebeck Street. This is like a secret passage somewhere below the ground. These are compact. This is the, this is the limiting one, the, the balanced one, which is non-compact. But in fact, you can go, as you know already, to, to Lawrence Street, a little bit, little bit further down, which is a better result because from here you can go there, but not back. But you cannot go to anything to the right from here. If your uh, Sobolev space actually has to be bigger than that, then there are stretches to, to different districts. So, how does this work <clears throat> in, in our case? So, now we have this, uh, okay, every, um, uh, there, is a, there is an analog of this, uh, of this weak space for every rearrangement invariant space. We call it a Marcinkiewicz space, MY here. Again, I can give the definition. Uh, okay, why not? But so far, you talk only about M equal to one. Uh, so far, I did, and here I have an M bigger than one. Yes, um, I don't have time to go to the uh, to the details, but let me tell you now that uh, 
it actually works for every every um, integer order. Yes, I can take for m, I can take anything, but it does not follow from what I did with Ron because, as I said at the beginning, uh, this is what we did together with Ron. It actually works for any integer, but not in the way that I uh, that I uh, said so far, because uh, the Poya Sege does not work for that. So, so for this, we have an what we call iteration scheme, which is much, much uh, younger, and we did it together with uh, Andrea Shanky from Florence and my PhD student Lenka Slavikova, and it appeared in advances uh, in 2015. So, so the answer to your question is yes, but I didn't mention it so far exactly as you say. You are absolutely right, but it works. And uh, in that case, the the operator that you want is this one. So here is an M, as, as expected, in fact, but, but, it, uh, but it's not so simple as it, as it looks. It cannot be proved by Poya Sege because simply Poya Sege does not work for that. So one has to do something else and we build up uh, an iteration scheme. So, so Mark, uh, uh, actually uh, inspired me to, to ask whether this embedding into a weak space is never compact. And the answer is yes. Yes meaning no, it's never compact. Yes, it's never compact. Yes, no. Um, and so uh, the question is, where is the gateway? So this was at one stage known as a Pick's conjecture. I had this intuition that this must be true, that uh, this uh, Marcinkiewicz space is uh, the last one, that anything bigger is already a compact, compact uh, range. So uh, I did a lot to prove my conjecture, that my intuition was right. And it turned out that I was completely wrong. It is not true, neither way. It's neither, it's not even necessary. This thing has nothing to do with compact embedding. So, so much about my intuition. And now, what is the, re what is the result? Okay, so, so the problem was, is there any reasonable characterization at all? I mean, the conjecture doesn't work. Yes, it is, but we need one more relation. We need a relation which is called uh, mainly in the Soviet literature as a uniformly absolutely continuous norm. In Western literature, uh, it is called uh, almost compact embedding. It means that uh, certain limit goes to zero uh, on all bounded functions. And uh, with the help of this, we can, we can actually solve the problem. So, uh, <clears throat> so the embedding is compact if and only if the nonsense is in this star embedding relation. Okay, so I think I've, uh, I've uh, exhausted my 50 minutes, so let me go to the end. I will just jump over, I have a lot of other nonsense, Gaussian and Lagrosse and all kinds of, okay, here, I will tell you at the end for what it works, you know, for what it, to what it can be uh, also, also uh, uh, applied. Uh, one of the, the thing is this Gaussian uh, logarithmic sublevel inequalities of court traces. Andrea and I published it uh, some time ago. Higher order, that's what you asked about. This is the thing with, with Lenka and, and Andrea. Um, Frostman measures, this is a, this is a nice concept. Uh, that's very, very new. Uh, we, we only discovered it very lately. Uh, it, it actually contains the traces, but we didn't know it before. Now, now we do. Um, Laplace transform, other operators. Uh, uh, Moser inequalities, existence of minimizers, and so on, so on, more. But as you can see, uh, reasonable journals uh, accept it, so, so maybe there's something reasonable in it. So we are basically at the end. 
let me um, let me finally think. Okay, oh, here is a okay, let's go over. Uh, look at this. This is interesting. Uh, this is an Avier Stokes equation, right? So here is some nonsense. Uh, I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, calculations. What is this? This is what I did together with my friend Josef Malek. This proves regularity of Navier-Stokes equations. Are we going to get million dollars? No, we are not going to get million dollars. Why not? Because this is the dimension two, and million dollars is for dimension three. So where the hell is this big difference between the dimension three and the dimension two? This is the same calculation from dimension three. Where is the problem? Where is the difference? Ladies and gentlemen, the difference is that, uh, sorry about this, the difference is that in dimension two, a Sobolev embedding, which is in the middle of this nonsense, is compact. But it is dependent on dimension and it is not compact for the dimension three. This difference between two and three is a difference between an exercise for a student and a million dollars. I mean, we uh, think that any other way to, to get million dollars is much easier probably than to prove regulate a very slow situation. But that is beside the point. The point is here the following. Maybe, you know, can an appropriate compact Sobolev embedding solve all the problems of the mankind? So on my answer, my answer is maybe. Who knows? But for me, this is a motivation that this is, this is the thing worth studying, okay? So, we are at the end. Um, thanks for funding. I've been funded over the years by many institutions that I would like to thank to. My alma mater, Charles University. I used to work in the academy. I used to work in Wales. Uh, I used to work in a lot of places. And of course, there is, the, uh, there is this, uh, these guys, you know, the science foundations. Uh, I even had an NATO grant once. Uh, I don't know if this is any good for military or whatever, but, but they gave me a lot of money, so thanks to them. Uh, okay, so this is a British thing. Uh, uh, this is some research council. I don't know what this is. Uh, Nyampa is an Italian uh, <clears throat> is an Italian institution that, that funds the research. I have a lot of joint research in Italy. Yes, there is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's not terribly popular, I must say. <laughs> and my last uh, thanks goes to the authors of the paintings. Maybe you, if you paid attention to the lecture, you saw there were some paintings. So the authors of paintings were these two ladies, Adela Picoa and Teresa Picoa. <laughs> And if you look uh, closely, you see that in Prague, the girls know how to dress properly, uh, uh, given occasion. So this is also my humble way to, to thank you this university for inviting me. That's all. Thank you very much. So you stated that one of your first results of this result from 2000, and it, um, so not remembering the specifics so much, but it was pretty nicely stated. And I'm, I'm wondering what gave you the intuition for that, if, uh, if it's something you can explain somewhat concisely. Okay, so the thing in 2000, that was uh, that uh, the Sobolev embedding is the same as the boundedness of the of the audio operator what gave me the intuition okay so ron and i we started uh, thinking about this in 1994 it was the year i was working in cardiff and i invited him there and ever since we were thinking about it and our first paper appeared only in 2000 it took some some doing but, um, you know, the thing is, one way, it is not terribly difficult. This way, it is, it is uh, just uh, some sort of uh, reduction, yes? 
And I think that was what, what was behind it. So we said, okay, so you have, you have funny functions and you are interested, you know, in some space, you are interested where they fall to. And we said, okay, so this is, this is difficult. Why don't we for a while think about functions that are radially symmetric? And for them, this is, this is not so difficult. And so what, what was difficult was to show that actually that is, that is all you need. That is, that is sufficient. And that we did by some very special combination of uh, interpolation and, and Poyasege. But what was, I don't remember really, we just, you know, it took... What would it be then the nature? I think it was the necessary condition. And we first go well to the necessary condition and we said, ah, it would be nice if it was sufficient, you know. Uh, why don't we have a look at that? How do we do it? How do we do it? Suppose that you want to prove that this nonsense is sufficient for this, then, then of course everything would be lovely, you know, stated in this, in this uh, one, one dimensional way. But how do you do it? And uh, then we discovered Poyasege. And Poyasege actually tells you that um, if you symmetrize a gradient, which means somebody gives you this nonsense here, and you turn it to something, uh, this is defined on a terrible set omega here. And you symmetrize everything. You symmetrize the set, and you symmetrize the function. Poyasege, in fact, tells you, if you apply it uh, in an appropriate way, that the norm of the gradient does not increase. And that's all you need, because the norm of the function itself stays the same. That's not so difficult, because the level sets, level sets are the same. So what you really want to know is that the norm of the gradient decreases. And that's Poyasege. So the you know Hungarians did most of the work on our behalf. We just applied the result. Well, there was a short question I could explain. You mentioned some stage logistic uh, zoning transformation. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's related, related to the arrangement. It is, yes. And uh, just very briefly on which space what transformation? Is it finite measure preserved? Uh, it doesn't have to be. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. It says sigma finite, sigma finite measure. That's that's necessary. You start uh, on a. You start with a sigma finite measure space. Okay, maybe you want it non-atomic, but even that is not not really necessary. Um, to get some parts of the theory you know, smooth, it's better to have it non-atomic, but it doesn't have to be finite measure. Uh, well, basically this is just uh, the following thing. You give me an F, right? A real, real function on a, on a sigma finite space. And what I'll do is the following. I'll uh, first of all measure the, the level sets. Yes, you give me a lambda. Uh, I'm looking at the measure of this set here. Where lambda is, lambda is here. Then I do the following. Then I'll define almost the inverse of that. But not quite. I, I just uh, I cannot write an inverse because this can be constant. On a, I mean, this is decreasing, but but not strictly. It can be constant. So I I just take uh, infimum over all lambda such that uh, this nonsense is less than t. And what I obtain this way, uh, this is the measure preserving transformation. What I obtain from here is the following. I get a function. Now this function is defined. Where is this defined? This is defined on an interval from zero to the measure of r. Yes, where r is the space, where is the measure? Two, zero, infinity, and it's decreasing, right? So I get a decreasing function here, which has the property that the level sets have the same measure as here. That is the, that is the measure preserving transformation we use. Basically, that's all. In proving that particular result that you mentioned, 
we um, have to work with uh, the equimeasure ability, right? Uh, because I mean, it would be lovely to to if it if the following was true. I mean, we would be happy as anyone if uh, if the optimal domain. <coughs> Could have been obtained this way, right? But it is not true. Uh, I mean, with a star, we cannot. You cannot do that. Instead of that, you need to take uh, whatever h and take a supreme over all. Functions that have the same distribution function. That's the measure preserving transformation. In some cases, this is true, but in many, it isn't. And uh, there are sufficient conditions, there are necessary conditions, there's theory behind it, but, but this is not true in general. So if this was true, then you know, everything would be perfect. We wouldn't need to go to these implicit formulas and all that nonsense, but this is not true. Well, one of your pictures shows this previous piece. Yes, yes. I recognize all the names, but one. So one is somebody by name Feichtinger. Feichtinger. Yeah, that's my friend from, okay, that's Hans Gork Feichtinger. Uh, uh, the, the reason why I, <laughs> yes, the reason why I uh, included him. Because he's your friend. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, part of the reason. But the uh, main reason is that uh, a week ago, Two weeks ago, the Feichtinger conjecture was uh, solved. And the Feichtinger conjecture, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but this is Hans Georg Feichtinger, the most amazing guy. I mean, he, he is in the University of Vienna, Vienna, whatever, uh, in Austria. Uh, he uh, is a leader and actually a creator of the of a thing called NUHAC, which is a numerical and a numerical and harmonic analysis group, and they uh, apply function spaces there to acoustics research, right? So you come there, there would be this you know uh, lab full of microphones, and he would come to the middle of it and say, "This is full of Fourier transform, you know, things like that." And most, uh, I really like this, and. Um, Applied, you know, perfect. And uh, he had some conjecture that con concerns the Gelfand triple, the L2, a zero, and I don't know what the on the other. I'm, I'm not expert in these in these things. And I know uh, because he told me he was in Prague two weeks ago, and he told me that his conjecture, the so-called Feichtinger conjecture, this is sometimes called the Feichtinger algebra, um, was solved. But I don't know exactly what it is, so I cannot go any further. Without yeah, making sure, 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 sure. So, uh, uh, what would be the optimal partner in one uh, with which we have the difficulty? Uh, well, you mean from uh, from which side? From uh, from the one into which one is not. into what? Yes. Okay, I'll tell you. So it's the following space. It's a it's a space. I call it whatever uh, Y, where the Functional that governs it is the following: you take a supremum of t times. Uh, uh, wait, 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 no, no, no sorry, sorry about that. It's uh, integral zero to one uh, supremum. Right. And uh, uh, wait a <laughs> so then. Well, then you can go from, oh, you're yeah, sorry, you asked from L1, oh, you're yeah, sorry, from L1 is just L1 infinity. But here you can get a bigger space, which is this Y, 
which is this way. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry, 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 sorry. So, both are equal. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think there is upper than that all. Yeah. We have time for. Thank you very much for your time. We are going to have a colloquium dinner at the 6.15 in Davo, Estavan. Yeah. If you want to join us, let me know. Thank <laughs> you.